Right on. Good morning slash afternoon slash evening slash midnight to everybody. Welcome to the weekly Mozilla Webmaker Community Call. We have a really, really excellent and packed agenda today that is a little bit different than our normal format. We've got two really substantial presentations going on, so we're going to uh, get those done and then see how much else we can squeeze in to the week. But uh, let's get things started. Uh, Matt, I believe we are in fact leading off with Mr. Mark Boas telling us about contextual video. That's right. Mark, are you there? Mark, are you there? Have you hit star seven? <clears throat> it's fun to visualize human beings madly fumbling with their telephonic device looking for the star and looking for the seven. Mark Boas, are you there? Do you care? Okay, G. Mark Boaz. All right, one last try, and otherwise Ryan be on deck to tell us about the Mozilla board slides if Mark fails to be able to de-silentify. The conference has been unmuted. Hey, Mark, are you there? Are you able to hit star seven to unmute? Um, I'm using Skype to dial in, so I've tried it on the on the pad, but um, okay. Well, why don't we just proceed un unmuted, and we'll just ask people to keep their line noise down. So, Mark, uh, why don't you go ahead? Okay. Um, okay. This is something that um, I'm doing as part of the Open News Night uh, Mozilla Fellowship, and what we were looking at is taking some of their uh, Al Jazeera English's um, great uh, so documentary Mark, can you hit, that they have. Mark, sorry, can you hit the share desktop button just so we can see what you're describing? Um, yeah, if I can find it. Uh, hold on. So the share desktop. Options. In the top left, I'm not like controls, Mark. I uh, got it. Awesome. Okay, the controls went away. Can you can you see that now? Yep, yep we can. Uh, click. Yep. Okay, so they've got some great material, and what I'm trying to do is to bring a bit of the experience I have about using web-based audio and video, and specifically libraries like Popcorn, to add information to. The, the experience without overwhelming the user too much, but just to try and make things a little bit more interactive and perhaps weave things into social media and that sort of thing. Thinking a lot about um, second screen, which is when you use perhaps a tablet in conjunction with a TV screen to, to look through video. So this is really a first pass at um, trying to create some sort of experience in in that way. So I can try and press play. I'm not sure how, how well this is going to work, but the idea is that on the right hand side we have some extra information and that will um, appear as certain time points are hit. Um, the other thing to, to know about this is that we have all the extra information detailed in uh, Google Doc and we're using tabletop.js to retrieve that information. So that makes it very easy for the editors to add uh, a bit, the extra content. So without further ado. So when we get to about 30 seconds, um, some content should come in. Right, so hopefully you could see that at that point um, some information dropped in and we could jump to that point in the video because it's going to be augmented so it's going to add to the, the body of information on the right hand side and kind of scroll up. In fact, if I scrub the video I should kind of do that. And so we can jump to any part of the video and we can also tweet out uh, anything that seems interesting to us and it will automatically kind of select 140 characters, the first 140 characters, and then give you a time point to link back into the video. 
Um, we've also got two ways of viewing the video. We can go to full screen, which actually, because it's in an iframe, isn't full screen, but um, try to some play. <coughs> Still work in progress, so there's some stuff that we're not quite tested fully yet. But um, when you go to full screen mode, you should see the information in a slightly different way. So it becomes less um, uh, in your face, let's say. It's more of just in the corner. So let's see if we can scrub that. And that kind of fades away after a while as opposed to the other view where we kind of see it on the right hand side. Um, and that's really just it. Um, I've used Popcorn.js and also the new IEH shim, which allows it to run on older browsers, which is, um, which is, which is great for people like Al Jazeera who want to, want to maximize you know, the viewing potential for things. And also it means that it works in Firefox using H.264. So just one format of um, video. And they only had it in that format at the moment. I'm actually pushing for them to use it then because it's a slightly better experience. And so that, that's really it. You can actually you can view it on, a, on an iPad and click on the standalone version. And what that does, it pops it out of the iframe. And a little icon will appear prompting you to add that to your home screen. So then it becomes a bit like a, uh, a web application. And what I'm hoping to do is to take a lot of their content, because they've got a lot of Creative Commons content, and make a, a fully fledged web app that will allow you to, you know, that you can kind of install or put on your mobile device or tablet and use all their great content. And I want to hopefully integrate universal subtitles and hypertranscripts and stuff like that. So that's it. I mean, it's all thanks to great libraries out there, specifically. Popcorn JS. I've used. Um, I've also used J Player, which is uh, our audio and video library that we work on, and it works well together. It's great. Right on. <coughs> well, Mark, this looks fantastic, and you're getting a lot of love on the Etherpad. Um, oh, good. Yeah. <coughs> so it says, Mark, please make tabletop.js plugin parser available. Lots of people have asked for it. That's from BG, <coughs> uh, not not the Gib Brothers. Um, <laughs> That's actually somebody see. else has made that, um, and it is available. And I've been talking to the guys who make it, and yeah, they're cool guys. So that's how. So, so, so it's available it. now, or that's still a work in progress? Well, it's no, it's available now. It's not something that I have made. I've just taken it and used it. Something that Dan Sinker tweeted out from one of his um, journalism conferences. Nice, excellent. So we know we know where to hunt that down. Excellent. Um, people love the tweeting out specific points on the time code, and they love the user experience for augmentation and context, finding it much less overwhelming. Um, one question, uh, what are the two blocks at the bottom, what are the raids in the Amazon and justice boat areas about? Are those other videos or? Yeah, it's a three-part series, so we were kind of linking to those, but actually the newer version, we're changing all of that as well because we're not going to uh, add the interactivity to all of them. This is just an experiment, a demo. So uh, I think we're going to use some other material for, for newer demos. So it's going to change. So when it goes live, I'll definitely let everyone know. You can check it out on the site. That's great. OK, and last question. What is next, and how can people get involved or hack or help? Well, it's all going to be put on GitHub. So getting involved should be easy. There's an open news GitHub uh, repo for anyone to look at what, what we're all working out on as uh, Knight Mozilla Fellows. And so you can get involved there or you can contact me. I'll put my details in there. And uh, I'd be happy to work with anybody on this, really. The more help I get, the better. <laughs> so, so I'll put my details in and there'll be a GitHub repo and I'll, I'll link to that as well. Right on. That is fantastic. And we thank you so much. Very, very exciting to see this up and running. So congratulations and thanks for sharing. Thank you. Ryan Merkley, rumor has it you've got scintillating slideware to share with this call. Are you there? And has, has Star 7 been your friend? Hey, Gunnar. I'm just going to mute yeah. all lines again. OK, great. So 
The conference has been muted. Gunnar hopefully is now unmuted. Ryan, are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Take it away. And uh, Matt, are you guys able to see my screen on the share? Yes, we are. Excellent. Okay, well, I've got 20 slides to get through and then 10 in the back end that are there for um, an operational update, which I'll skip over quickly. Uh, if you guys go into the Etherpad, you'll find the link for the slides in a, in a Dropbox share, so you can grab them and go through them at your own pace. Uh, but I'll take you through them quickly. Um, the context for these slides is that last week, um, Mark and I were in Mountain View uh, to make uh, a presentation to uh, the board at one of our two annual face-to-face -face meetings. We meet remotely the rest of the year, uh, and twice annually we meet with them in person. We use that as an opportunity to, um, in the early part of the year, have them meet with Gary um, from the product group and talk about his planning. We also made a presentation on metrics, which uh, I want to share with you. And so I'll take you through where we're at. Uh, the front end has a bit of context, and then the back end is the metrics. Um, so first of all, I think all of you and all of us working in this space know that there is a ton of buzz in the area that we're working right now. Um, it seems like everybody uh, is popping up a code teaching startup, uh, for-profit, non-profit, government. Um, everybody's interested in it, and that says to me we're in the right place at the right time. But also what's interesting about it is that nobody is focused um, on the kind of learning where people are making real things on the web in the way that we are. And so there's a, there's a market gap, uh, and I think there's a chance for us to fill it. Um, now more than ever, we have a clear plan around uh, what we're describing as software, recipes, and community. Software, self-explanatory. Recipes is the templates and the missions and all the various components that go into those tools to give people ways to um, experience that software and make things on the web. And community includes both organizers and instructors, people who know how to use our, uh, our materials uh, and are teaching others, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in large groups. The main metric I think that we should be focusing on this, this year and what we pitched to the board uh, was to focus on contributors um, as our main 2012 metric because it is the multiplier that will help us to drive impact and reach. And we've segmented those into three groups, uh, coders, templators, and instructors, and I'll come back to those uh, in the second half. Our software vision is as clear as it's ever been. Uh, Popcorn Maker at the front of the queue, tracking towards 1.0, shipping in time with the festival, um, and adding some new UX ideas that came from Hackasaurus around discovery and learning. Um, simplifying and consolidating the Hackasaurus tools that we all know and love, from the X-ray goggles, the love bomb, and the story thing, into uh, taking the best of those and building the web page maker, which will be part of our summer campaign, and building a coherent software team, um, most of which um, most of our new team members are now working, with the exception of Scott, who starts later this month. Um, and we're looking for, uh, still looking for that senior software person, um, which is the one vacancy. Tying learning and skills more tightly to software, um, building the template system, which gives people a way to create an experience that works inside the software and extends the reach of it. Um, sometimes I describe that as like brushes in Photoshop, um, but also the idea that you can build an experience in a template and then that can be uh, extended uh, through using the software. Um, badges are moving along nicely and being designed in the learning materials. And obviously the hack jams, pop-ups, and the summer campaign, which we're working on, uh, will help us build the community around all of that. Uh, and give us, honestly, a testing ground to see if the assumptions that we're making about learning um, and the tools are right uh, or not. Um, one financial update, um, grants and donations started strong at the end of, by the end of Q1 this year, um, in large part because of uh, the good work of Jeffrey and Mark on the grant side, which brought in new grants, uh, almost a half a million dollars in new grants uh, at the beginning, uh, came online at the beginning of this year, including Ford, uh, Moore and the Sloan Foundations, um, and also a really good uh, swing back effect on individual donations uh, coming from the strong end of year campaign that Ben led, um, about $204,000 from individual donors, almost 7,000 new donors by the end of Q1, which is really, uh, really impressive to have that many new individual donors joining us. Um, and just by way of comparison, total individual donations in 2010 was 
um, $130,000. So $204,000 in the first quarter is pretty impressive and really uh, building on the base that we started last year uh, through the work that, uh, that Ben and I did and the other folks on the joint team. So let's talk about metrics. Um, we need to evolve into a metrics-driven organization. We need to move from a place of, um, uh, from the place where we've been in terms of trying lots of things and iterating one-on-one -on -one, to digging into having a deeper understanding of our users and how they're using our products, um, how people are learning, and how people are contributing um, in order to be able to level those people up and, br and bring them up the chain to turn um, users of our products into contributors of our products to turn um, individual creators into mentors and peer learners. Um, and in order to do that, we need some metric, a metric space of understanding uh, to drive that analysis. The original plan that we pitched to the board um, in the fall of last year um, was pretty broad. Um, we had some pretty big buckets and a lot underneath them, understanding, skills, and innovation, and there were a bunch of component parts underneath them. Um, and as, a, as we looked at where we're focused now, um, and the structure that we're operating under and our uh, idea about how we work, um, and we looked at it against this, the truth is it's really, really complicated. There's a lot there and it doesn't all necessarily hang together. Um, and it's, I wasn't convinced that it would put us in a place where we had operational metrics that allowed us to evolve um, our offering, both on the software side and on the learning side. And so my goal was to try and whittle this down. And, and clarify, um, hopefully to a single metric. Um, and the metric that I, that I think is ideal for us is contributors. We said uh, when we went through the hedgehog process that contributors were uh, what drove our, research, our, our uh, resource engine. We know that that's what helps us multiply our reach. We know that we are small teams uh, and that if we can bring people into the project, we can do the same thing that um, we did with Firefox, which is vastly multiply our reach. Uh, by building uh, a contributor community that can uh, extend the products and also take them in directions we wouldn't necessarily um, have planned. Three buckets uh, that I'm working with uh, for this group, coders, templators, and instructors. And I'll unpack those. And I'm also going to share with you some initial, um, uh, some initial kind of assessments of where we're at based on what I heard back from different, uh, the different project teams and also some very preliminary um, kind of estimates for where we'd hope to be by the end of the year. And these are rough, um, and the way that we describe this to the board is, you know, 2012 is really a baselining year. Um, we have no baseline metric for this, and so we're going to figure it out together. And I think the summer campaign uh, is the first place where we're going to do that. And when we get back together at the end of the uh, summer and we look at where we got, uh, I think we'll have a much better picture of, of uh, what the baseline could be and how to grow from there. Coders, self-explanatory. These are people who are filing patches, filing bugs, fixing bugs, um, and I've also included people doing L10N in that group. Um, I think roughly we have about 75 people active in that community to varying degrees, and the majority of them are in Popcorn. So our preliminary target for 2012 would be to double that group. Um, and to, um, I'm already seeing, certainly in the software weekly calls, lots of discussion about how to point the chairs outward and do more work to bring people into the project. Um, and I think we'll continue that and get more structured about what, what makes up a software project and what are the ways in which we point the chairs outward. Um, even as simple as the launch of um, the new Labs website, which went live yesterday, which also includes a number of our projects um, with simple links and ways for people to find their way in. So if you want to find your way to the repo, it's quickly linked. You can get into the project. Templators we're using as a separate group. These are people who are making remixable pages, everything from the pop-up video template to people who are building missions that could live in the Web Page Maker app. Um, we've taken a broad definition in terms of the baseline. There are probably 50 people who have built um, good or usable or interesting popcorn demos. Those have yet to all be turned into templates. Um, and part of that is our, is, is our work making it easy for them to do that, and the new version of Popcorn Maker makes that much easier, um, but also um, letting people know that that's a thing that we do, building the gallery that makes it possible for those to be surfaced. And so our goal by the end of 2012 would be to um, 4x that number and have 200 people with templates in a gallery that is searchable 
um, and that where the best ones bubble up, um, and even uh, even better where the um, the uh, the best of those uh, could also be shipped as part of releases of future popcorn maker um, releases. Um, again, kind of like brushes in Photoshop or tools that you can use to extend the power of the app. And the last group is, is instructors, which includes both mentors and peer learners, and if, or peer teachers and event organizers. Um, there are probably about 200 people through our work in Hive, through Mojo, and through the new instructor work that's going on that Michelle is leading. Um, our goal is pretty ambitious, but we also have a strong campaign that we're launching throughout the summer is to increase that 5x to have 1,000 people um, through the summer campaign and the new event platform uh, by the end of year that would identify themselves as people who have organized an event or that are doing uh, peer teaching or are acting as mentors within our community. So as I said before, there's no precedent for this and for us. This is our first year running the program in this way, so it's our baseline year. And when we come back in September, um, we'll look at where we're at um, and our goal to move users into being contributors, contributors to organizers and instructors. Um, these aren't the only things that we're going to track, but this is the operational metric that we're going to focus on. So you will see um, all of our uh, product leads coming back and say, looking at our various, uh, the various things that we're putting out into the world, saying, how are we building this for contribution? What are we doing in this launch in order to invite people in? How are we uh, building this website so people see a way to contribute? Um, how are we running this event in a way that volunteers can take a lead role? Um, and so that's going to be a constant narrative, um, and it's the thing that we're all going to be um, digging into. In addition to that, we're going to track software adoption. We're going to track badges issued. We're going to keep track of fundraising. These are basic operating metrics that we need to keep track of, but we're not going to, uh, these aren't going to be the core, uh, the core operating metric. We're going to focus. We're going to get up every day and say, how are we driving contribution into these projects in order to extend our reach? The back half has an operational update in it. Um, one, I want to call out Ben Moskovitz for his really great jumping in this photo. Um, also, Ross on the left. Um, nice job, Ross. Um, and so uh, I'm going to skip through this really quickly. Um, or if people have questions about it, I'll take them at the end. Um, and some of this comes back from uh, the front end in the executive summary. Um, I'll call your attention to the software release schedule. Um, it was really nice to go in front of the board and be able to tell them about all the things that had shipped in the first quarter or that were coming over the course of the next quarter. Um, we have really put a lot of horsepower in this place, and people have really stepped up uh, and put some rigor behind that, and it feels really good. And there was, I can tell you that the board was really impressed. There was a lot of excitement, and um, lots of people already knew about the things we were talking about um, and had already been paying attention and had been seeing uh, the work that you're doing. And so I think that was a really positive thing to see coming back around. Um, things that we have already talked about. Team is already in place. We're almost done hiring for this year. Um, and I just wanted to bring to your attention our org chart. Um, slide 28 is the org chart as it was when I started about a year and a half ago. Um, and slide 29 is the org chart today. Um, only a few vacancies left. Uh, we are almost finished our hiring for this year. Um, but. Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty impressive and significant growth, and I think we've done a good job to manage it with a reasonable amount of growing pains. Um, so uh, the last slide there just shows the, the layering on of the, of the groups. Uh, there's a fundraising slide, donations, which you've already seen, and that is really the end of, um, of the deck. So happy to take questions. Um, I'm just going to switch over to the Etherpad so I can see what people know people have been taking, and happy to take any questions from folks um, or uh, take your comments. Right on, Ryan. Congratulations. That was a super tight deck rockin'. Um, so what tools or data do we have available today to automate metrics tracking and analysis? Uh, so that's my question for the folks on this call. And Go! I have instant uh, answers for it, but I'd be eager to hear what what people already have in the queue that we can tap into in order to draw on these metrics. Um, some of this stuff will be baked into the events, uh, the events back end that we're building. Um, we obviously have bug trackers um, and issue trackers that we use to give us um, some of those metrics. Um, and so the question is, are there other things that we don't know about um, or other things that we can spin up easily and that are lightweight that can automate some of this? 
Excellent. Hey, this is uh, this has been one really great thing about how we're building popcorn makers that the analytics for this will be built in. Um, we'll be able to know, you know who's contributing templates, who's forking, and the rest is kind of nice. Very cool. Um, a question, is learners not a core metric that is followed by a plus one? Uh, learners goes on the operational metrics list, but the, um, I think it's really important that we focus on the multiplying factor that's available to us from bringing in contributors. Um, so you know, each contributor we bring in, especially an instructor or an organizer, is going to build or run an event that is going to bring in learners. Um, and so that each time that creates multipliers. Um, so I'm not in no way am I saying that we're not going to track learners, just like we are definitely going to track users. Um, but in this phase of the organization, as we are very small and very ambitious, bringing new people in and building products that are designed for contribution is the number one thing that's going to allow us to extend our reach and bring more learners and users to our products. Cool. And then the next question, uh, how do we define a contributor? Uh, just I think that's an elaboration of the slide where you elaborated on that. Um, I'm not sure who asked the question. Beyond, going, beyond coders, templators, uh, instructors, and organizers, is there a, is there a more detailed um, inquiry about that? Or did that well, I think it's the, it's the number that drove the question, 150 people we consider contributors. I'm inferring that that strikes somebody as a number they were not expecting, either high or low, and I'm guessing. Um, I don't. I'm not seeing the 150 number. The number was line 159. No, I see it there. But in the presentation uh, deck, uh, slides 15, 16, 17, it was 75 active coders, 50 people making popcorn demos, and 200 people who have been. Uh, instructors through Hive Mojo and the new instructor group that we're working on. Um, so we've kind of set some preliminary targets. The only place to see 150 is the idea of doubling the number of coders, which is people who submit patches, file bugs, fix bugs, and contribute to L10n. Um, so that's, um, I would say, you know, those those numbers are. I guess based on what we think is possible and what we also think is ambitious enough to, to push ourselves um, in terms of uh, goals for this year. Got it. Thank you. Um, okay. And uh, just looking at the clock, I think we've got time for one more. I will point people to Greg W's question about how the focus on metric squares with Jeffrey McDougall's thoughts on metrics for nonprofits and that link to that blog post. Uh, I think that would be a longer discussion than we have time for right now. But uh, last question for you, Ryan, before we move on. Uh, what were your biggest recent aha moments out of this planning process? What's new or what's changed since we first started making this pitch three months ago? Um, you know, the thing that was most, most of an aha for me was, trying, was, was really trying to whittle this down into something that was um, doable, um, that didn't consume 100% uh, of our uh, of our time and actually led us to make changes in the way that we ran the organization. Um, we came at the metrics question almost a year ago and we did a bunch of work together. Um, and what we ended up with was kind of a laundry list of, um, laundry list of useful metrics, um, but not a structure that put us in a position to let those metrics drive our, our operation. Um, and I spent a bunch of time looking at where we were at, uh, the new focus on strategy, and also I spent a bunch of time with the folks at Wikipedia who are struggling with the same issue, uh, and looked at the way they're they're driving uh, and focusing on driving contribution. Um, and I think there's a lot to model there, and have uh, have spent a bunch of time with them, uh, looking at how we can uh, learn from what they're doing. And so the aha was, um, you know, trying to focus on a single metric that can drive. Uh, drive growth and also drive our operation, not just um, our numbers. Right on. Thank you very, very much. Fantastic presentation. And uh, I'll invite other people with other questions to put them in the Etherpad where Ryan can track them all back. Um, let us move forward to Mozilla Webmaker website, content strategy, and IA discussion. Matt and Chris. Thanks, Gunnar. So I think this actually will flow well out of Ryan's uh, presentation. Uh, as many of you know, um, we've been doing a lot of work around content strategy and information architecture for the new Mozilla Webmaker uh, website. Chris uh, Appleton presented some early branding concepts uh, and this 
fall, and since then it's been doing a lot of uh, wireframing and mock-up mock -up work. Um, and what we've been really wrestling with is what is the best way to kind of prevent the Mozilla web, present the Mozilla Webmaker story through a clear content strategy and, and information architecture. Um, sorry, I'm just checking to see. It looks like there's a lot of lag time on the web meeting version of these slides. So I, I apologize. It may be easier to follow along in the link that's in the etherpad. Um, so what I really want to dig into is what we see as the core design challenge for um, the content strategy, which is how do we allow web makers to, who are arriving at the site uh, potentially for the first time to make something amazing fast. And the second thing that we've been really trying to put at the core of our, our thinking is how do we design in a way that, that makes contribution um, content better, that really positions contribution, as, as Ryan said, is the metric, the single metric that matters most and is the guiding principle of all our work. Um, and so I think you know, the content strategy, in a nutshell, is not going to be surprising to anybody here. Some version of these three things. We don't necessarily have the same terms for them, but it's some mix of tools, resources, and events uh, for web makers. And we all use kind of different words for these. So, um, you know, in, in some of Mark's slides, he talks about software, recipes, and, and events. Um, we talk about authoring tools. In some of Chris's early IA work, he used the, the word activities for this second bucket. Um, and this, this second bucket around activities for web makers is where I really want to focus this presentation and get your help and, and feedback. Um, because I think we have clarity around tools. We know, we know what the tools are. There's stuff like uh, Mozilla Popcorn, Mozilla Hackasaurus, a new web page maker app that we're working on. We have a lot of clarity, thanks to the events team, around what we're doing in, in events and how we're going to uh, surface that through the website. Um, where I think we can really uh, benefit from getting our, our some alignment uh, and our thinking in terms is on the second piece, the resources or activities piece, um, or what Mark calls recipes. Um, and we have a bunch of different terms and content types that potentially kind of float under this, this bucket from recipes and kits and how-tos, explaining steps in a process, to templates, the kind of um, template makers that, that Ryan was just talking about, to starter projects, easy ways for web makers to get started making something quickly, to missions and challenges. So, a lot of you have kind of um, you know, chatted with me recently about the fact that we have a million different terms that are kind of floating under this umbrella um, and expressing a desire to get some consistency around how we think and, and talk about these pieces. And if we kind of take a step back from the semantics for a minute and just think about some simple metaphors um, and how we connect these three, these three pieces of the content in a story, you know, you can easily imagine a metaphor like the t like a tool is a hammer, an activity is now go build your first birdhouse with that, that hammer, and an event is get together with other birdhouse makers to refine your skills. Or here's a samurai sword, here's how to use it to slice up a watermelon, and here's an event where you can get together with a bunch of other um, fruit ninjas and, and sharpen your skills. Or more concretely, you know, here's a set of x-ray goggles, um, here's how to use them to hack this web page, um, and here's a hack jam where you can um, get together and, and go deeper in a way that is fun and social. Um, so when we think about other examples that kind of already exist that fit a similar kind of pattern, you know, we think about things like Popular Mechanics, which has um, DIY projects for, for makers, um, uh, Katrin shared this little bit site uh, last week that has uh, projects that get kids interested in electronics. Um, and of course the most obvious example is uh, Make Magazine and the Make Project site. Um, and I've actually been spending a lot of time here to see what we can uh, learn from their, their model and, and what may be applicable to our own work. I think that um, you know, where Chris and I have kind of landed in terms of how we really refine our understanding of the resources or activity piece of the site is that 
if popular mechanics and little bits and Make Magazine provide essentially projects for makers, what this part of the site in, in essence is really it's projects for web makers and that's really what they are. Um, whether it's you know making your first web page with Hackasaurus or teaching someone how to do the same thing or you know making a web video book report or uh, making your own web-based video game using HTML as a level editor or uh, you know creating a news app with open news that can change the way people see the world or designing robotics badges for NASA, or making a website that flies, or a Twitter-powered robot, that um, essentially all of these things are web maker projects. And that the opportunity for this site is to really um, identify and package those bite-sized pieces of making and building and surface them through a very simple gallery that makes it easy for people to put their hands on and make something amazing. Um, and when we sort of unpack what form those projects may take, I think there's really kind of three um, categories that, that are kind of worth thinking about. You know, make something, um, how-tos, and contribution, opportunities to actually build along with us. And so that, you know, those make something projects can range from um, easy kind of first-timer stuff, like making a pop-up video or sending a love bomb to your mom. Um, but they can also include um, more advanced or kind of um, you know, higher order items on that ladder of engagement, like um, building a one gigabit per second app that can revolutionize healthcare, or making your own popcorn maker template, or creating a learning challenge that teaches people CSS. Um, how to's, you know, we think about stuff like uh, as part of the summer campaign, how to tweak your Tumblr template or you might be an instructor who's sharing curriculum or a lesson plan on how to teach Hackasaurus for, for kids interested in, in hip hop. And then on the contribution side, um, you know, we can imagine um, everything from getting involved in localization, like help us translate Hackasaurus into, into Mandarin, or help build the next version of our event kit, or beta test the next version of, of Popcorn Maker. And I think the aha moment for me in this process is that you know really these are all basically just three different versions of the same thing. That rather than sort of bracketing contribution and co-building off into its own little part of the site or into its own little ghetto, that we can basically just imagine it as simply another form of making something. Um, and that really these three uh, categories are just different flavors of the same thing. Um, and then we can begin to imagine them on a kind of a ladder of engagement. They may start with making something simple quickly, like hacking your first web page, and then um, you know, taking you up a ladder of making or a ladder of engagement um, that blends pretty seamlessly into designing and co-building and contributing with us as part of a web maker community. Um, so it's not just like, you know, when we think about you know, make magazine for web makers, for example. I think one of the interesting differences is that, um, you know, on the web maker site, you actually have the opportunity to, like, you know, it's the equivalent of make make magazine. That you actually have the opportunity um, to design and build, not just to consume. Um, and that there's something about that that is very Mozilla, that mix of casual making with the opportunity to go deep and co-build and actually get in the cockpit and kind of fly the plane that I think is really core to our brand and our voice and our story. Like this is part of what gives Mozilla its unique energy and voice um, and so we want to really instill that deeply in the experience of the, of the website. Um, so when we kind of take a step back and think, okay, if we're doing uh, projects for web makers, what are some of the common or core ingredients of this project? And if you look at the way this works on, on other websites, you know, we begin to see a kind of common five-part anatomy. You know, it really leads with a cool thing you can make. So it doesn't start with, here's how to use a soldering iron. It starts with, hey, make your own electric guitar. And then as part of that process, you're going to learn to use a few tools. You're going to follow a recipe or a set of steps. Um, there's a, usually a set of tags that aid with discoverability or helping you find what you're most interested in. 
from topic area to levels of, <coughs> levels of difficulty. And also crucially, and I think this is really important for our work, uh, a contributor, somebody who actually authored the project and, and, and shared it. And we can see this, I think, mapping pretty directly to our own work and web maker projects. Lead with the cool thing as opposed to leading with the tool. In this case, say making a pop-up video, um, you're going to grab onto some web maker tools like Popcorn to help you make it. Here's a very simple set of steps or how to. This is something I think that we have a real opportunity to do better, really boiling down how you make this stuff in very, very clear and simple terms. Um, you had a set of, have a set of tags by difficulty, by tool, by audience, by um, interest area, and a contributor. So say it's Jonathan McIntosh who has um, contributed this particular WebMaker project. So what does all that mean for our information architecture on the new site? I think very simply it means, uh, number one, a concrete proposal from Chris and I that what we really should be calling this second bucket uh, is project. Um, that's what everybody else calls them. That's what Popular Mechanics calls them. That's what Make calls them. That's what Little Bits calls them. Um, I, you know, I, I think we're of the opinion that that's basically the most telegraphic term. Uh, and that projects come first. Um, that basically a uh, cool web maker project is really at the heart of what we're, we're, we're offering with the, with the new site. Um, and so you know, we can imagine a sort of you know, uh, top level navigation that is as simple as projects, tools, and events. Um, <laughs> uh, I guess part of what we like about that is that you know, it's telegraphic, it's clear, it's three things, and I, and I think in a way it helps to really communicate. Uh, it's, it's more than nav, it's a story about what Mozilla WebMaker is in a way that hopefully is very clear and telegraphic. So when you click on projects, what do you see? You essentially see a simple gallery of WebMaker projects um, that are easily uh, searchable, mix and matchable by, uh, by tag. So it's essentially a very simple project gallery, um, not really that different from something like uh, the project gallery at uh, Make Projects. So you've got the ability to sort by recent projects, popular projects, you can dig in by subject area. And when you click on one of those projects, you essentially get, um, there's, there's a you know, simple wireframe here, but it's really, um, Basically, I think in content management terms, it's, it's really just a kind of a, a blog post template. And you know, I think what we're going to do is really avoid the kind of over-engineered or over-complicated approach that I think we've, we've been tempted to take in the past, um, and really just keep it simple. It's like you know, um, a chance to add some, some body copy, um, describe the project, steps in the process, a little bit about the contributor, some tags. Uh, and comments, and that's, that's really it. So a big emphasis on, on keeping it simple. Um, so just to, just to kind of wrap up, you know, why do we like this, this, this approach? There's really three reasons. The first is, you know, when we did the survey of drumbeat.org uh, users uh, a couple quarters back now, I guess it was, the number one most consistent piece of feedback we get is give me easy ways to get involved. Um, give me like a bite-sized uh, participation ask that I can grab onto easily. And I think in some ways that's really um, the number one um, design imperative for the, for the new site, um, that we can use these WebMaker projects as a way to create very simple bite-sized recipe cards for making and, and getting involved. So drawing from the best content across our various program sites and really boiling them down into those dead simple recipe cards. And it's also a chance for us to take a more kind of maker-centric, like what can I make or build uh, approach as opposed to the more program-centric uh, approach we've been taking or campaign-centric approach we've been taking so far. So it's a chance to take an app like, hey, participate in the DML badges for lifelong learning competition and try and distill it into something as make or build focused as design digital badges for NASA, or um, moving from a sort of tool or software-centric approach, like, hey, try out Popcorn Maker, um, which is cool, but how do you know you want to try it? Like, 
it's a chance for us to say, hey, make a pop-up video, or you know, make a guided website tour, or uh, make a, a video book report. So less tool focused, more make focused, um, and constantly looking for opportunities for us to scale contribution. Um, I guess the second reason we, we like it, and this, this is meant to answer a question I've been getting, we've been getting a lot lately, which is, so how will this new Webmaker site affect my own project? Um, and where will you know, X or Y live? So for example, um, Jess and I were talking last week about these templates she's creating for the Webmaker app. Um, where do those live? You know, are they going to live on the new site, or do they live on some other site? I think there's a really simple answer to that question, which is, you know, we're really firm believers in the mullet strategy, um, and so Thank you, Matt. that this is a this is a picture of me when I was uh, when I was 12. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, this is basically the front of the mullet. That the new webmaker site is the front of the mullet, um, and you know, we can think of it as thin, pretty, and dumb. So thin in the sense that it's a thin layer, a thin gallery or layer over top of stuff that, you know, generally speaking, probably exists elsewhere on the web. It's pretty in the sense that we use this as a place to really try to bring some um, professional grade copywriting and professional grade design and, and look and, and feel. And it's dumb in the sense that if you're building, you know, functionality that is any more robust than a blog post, you know, it's probably not going to live on the Webmaker site. It's probably going to live somewhere else. Um, so, you know, I think in concrete terms, what that means is, you know, we have a gallery of Webmaker projects, um, but really, you know, most of them are linking out to assets and functionality that exist elsewhere. So, you know, I think that the short answer is, if you're building something, you know, already, like right now, that lives somewhere else, um, you know, chances are virtually certain that it's just going to continue living wherever it does and that we'll use the, the project gallery simply as a way to help you, um, you know, gain audience and, and drive people uh, to content and functionality that exists other places. Matt, this is better. We're at about 20 minutes, so I just wanted to check in with you and sort of see how you wanted to tie this off. Yeah, let's just, I'm, this is the last slide. so. Um, you know, I guess what we just wanted to flag is, you know, the, the main reason why we, we were excited about this is, you know, it kind of speaks to Ryan's point about trying to open the door for, for massively scalable contribution. Um, that, you know, contributing these projects, if people take the tools and kind of make them their own, that, you know, ultimately this is a way for people to kind of share back their, 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 their projects in a, in a scalable way. Um, so I guess you know that's something we need to think more about how that process works. But um, anyways, I apologize for the long presentation, but um, just wanted to let folks know kind of uh, where we're headed. And I guess um, you know we should just open up to, to questions and see whether this you know makes sense and um, you know whether people think that we're on the on the right track. Awesome. Thank you, Matt. There is a bunch of questions in the um, in the Etherpad starting at line 197. I think what I might invite you to do, Matt, is cherry pick uh, one or two that you think are most worthy of responding to now, and then commit you to a blog post answering the other ones later. If that sounds like a fair game. Uh, cool. Um, oh, first question. So. Where do programs like Ignite or Hive get categorized? So um, there is a, uh, in Chris's current wireframes, there's a, essentially a gallery that will live on the front page. And I think, is it just on the front page, Chris, or actually across, is your current thing it'll be across all pages? Yes, yeah, so I think um, in general. You might have to lean in. Sure. I think in general things like um, Ignite or Hive um, and other sort of program specific things will be sort of sprinkled across. The, the whole site. Um, but yeah, what Matt was talking about on the home page, um, I think there will be an opportunity to kind of, uh, similar to how we might push out news, um, sort of have an area to push out featured content, whether it's a, a summer campaign, um, the Ignite challenge, uh, an event that's happening through Hive, um, and really sort of use that to sort of uh, focus and um, support that type of content more than just uh, like a stream of headlines. So 
um, similar to how you might see like an, an ad on a, another site, this would be um, an area to sort of feature things that are specific to the WebMaker initiative um, and point them to the different uh, directions throughout. Cool. Um, is activities a more accessible word than project? Um, yeah, we, we've kind of bounced back and forth on this quite a, quite a bit. I guess you know, the, the, the limitation for me is um, activities sounds a bit more hobbyist or like an activity book for kids. Like it's something that you um, do primarily just kind of as a hobbyist or to like fill some time or to learn a thing. Um, whereas to me, project kind of um, has more of that kind of aspirational, like make something amazing or important kind of feel. Um, but yeah, we'll have to do some more, more testing. I think part of what pushed us there is just looking at, you know, when we look at what else is like this, you know, projects is the word that people seem most familiar with and is in, in the most common usage. Um, Right on. Can that jump out, you think are key? Um, I think. I mean, I think these are all great questions. But as I said, I think some follow-on, more uh, sort of structured response is probably the right way to clarify the stuff that's been said. If that sounds okay to you. Yep. Love it. All right. Well, we have a couple minutes left, and the next thing on the agenda is Ben, the popcorn maker. How to contribute? Can you tell us in three minutes or less, Ben, how to contribute? Star seven to become unsilent. Hello, am I unsilent? You are unsilent. Cool. I will be very brief, and it's a nice segue from the kind of uh, the make and the contributor stuff. So there's a there's kind of three planes of how to get involved in popcorn makers, and I've made a very simple visualization at that web page, that blog post. Um, it's going to evolve into something a little bit more interactive and popcorn driven, but it's interesting for now just to um, the first way that you can contribute to popcorn makers by making a template. And the templates are actually pretty easy. Um, I wouldn't categorize them as hard in the WebMaker site, for instance. I'd actually categorize them as quite simple because they're just basically HTML with some special tags. Um, the second plane, which is slightly harder, um, is contributing to Butter itself. And Butter is the kind of foundation for Popcorn Maker. It's the, the UI for the tracks. Um, it's the project management and the saving and all that good stuff. Um, but if you want to hack on the app itself, it's very easy to get involved in, in doing that. And there's links in the page. And then the third plan of how to get involved is actually to get involved in making popcorn plugins. Um, so you know we have 20 or 25-ish plugins that do various things, like you know, draw graffiti, go get a map, um, spawn a video. But every time somebody writes a plugin, the like power of the plugin is supposed to expand. Ben, ben, this is Gunnar. You're, you're breaking up. Can you get closer to your mic or otherwise attempt to improve your audio? Yeah. Uh, I was just having a map. You're still pretty bad. Getting worse. Walk to the window. Put tinfoil on your head. I can join in uh, to uh, make up for my colleagues. If that's necessary. Awesome. Thank you, Brett. Take it away. Uh, I think Ben was probably just going to end there on uh, a brown bag uh, that they've organized, which will, will be in Mountain View in Toronto. Um, so for those who aren't familiar with the brown bags, um, they happen uh, within Mozilla offices, uh, but as well um, they're available on Air Mozilla. So Ben's going to be breaking, he's going to be walking through a lot of these contributor channels and, and how to get involved. And a lot of this is really um, aimed at the broader Mozilla community because there are lots of folks uh, who are starting to get interested from other projects, for instance, um, within the the sort of Pancake Project or the OpenID folks have actually contributed uh, to our code base, so we're trying to get more of that going on. Awesome. Thank you so much. 
All right, well, we are coming up on the end of the hour. Uh, Matthew Thompson, is there anything else on this agenda that you think is critical to get addressed this week, and otherwise we will lovingly push it to next week? Uh, I guess the only, only last question I had for this group was in line 346. Um, do we want to present something on the summer campaign in this coming Monday's Mozilla All Hands call, or do we want to push that back a week? Um, probably don't have to answer right now, but I'll just, I'll just kind of throw that question out and we can follow up offline. Cool. We have one minute, so if anybody would like to share an opinion before we move to close. Uh, Michelle says we can decide in the summer party call, which co conveniently is taking place on this very line in only 60 seconds. Cool. Right um, on. Gunnar, I see there's, a, there's a, going to be a design jam in Barcelona tomorrow. Uh, if somebody wants to throw a link, we can um, tweet that out. Cool, yes. And Please do throw out a tweetable link to the design jam in Barcelona, Barcelona design jammers. And MozCamp Latin America kicks off this week, April 20th to 22nd. I'll put a link Excellent. on that. So, as a matter of process, the stuff we didn't get to this week, which includes the summer campaign update with Aaron and Michelle Thorne, as well as some Hive New York City air casting open source citizen science Android app updates, we'll push that and other exciting topics to next week's weekly WebMaker call. We thank everybody for being a part of this great hour, and thanks to everybody who presented and asked great questions. Have a great week, and thank you all for coming. Bye. Bye, Gunnar. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Please stand by.